turn to God's infallible and errant word, and it's recorded for us and for God's purposes. And we're going to be looking at, at uh, and I apologize, I hope to get to some shorter sections here, but I do want to go through this, these sections, and you have to get a sense for this as a whole, and, and it's important here. Uh, it's so easy sometimes to look at one verse and even take it out of context, but but we see this story and God revealing his people and, and revealing that we cannot bring salvation for ourselves. We just make a mess of things in life. And yet we see God's grace working faithfully. So let's read from Genesis 29, found on page 27 of your pew Bibles. It'll be the first 30 verses there. So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and he saw a well in the field. And behold, there was a flock of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks, and a large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there, and they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, uh, water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. And Jacob said to them, Brethren, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. Then he said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said to them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Then he said, look, it is still high day. It's not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. Now while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, and for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. And so she ran and told her father, and it came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely you are bone of my bone and, and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me. What should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. And now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. And so Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. And then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go into her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. And Laban gave his maid, Zilpah, to his daughter Leah as a maid. And so it came a house in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what have you done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, it must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week, and we will give you this one also for your service, which you will serve with me still another seven years. And then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. And so... He gave him his daughter Rachel as wife also. And Laban gave his maid Bilhah to the daughter of Rachel as a maid. Then Jacob also went into Rachel, and she, he also loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served with Laban still another seven years. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, it's hard to miss as we look at God's word. God is so painfully honest. He reveals warts and all of all of his people throughout the generations to humble and encourage and to direct our eyes to God's grace and faithfulness in all of our life. Because the reality is, over and over we see how God takes crooked people and like a crooked stick, he draws a straight line to fulfill all of his gracious promises. This is God's covenant faithfulness. You know, we just sang that earlier. It's, it's probably one of the favorite hymns, maybe, of many of you. It's by Thomas Chisholm. 
And great is thy faithfulness. Wasn't written like many songs are because of some great tri trial or deliverance. But, but he was reflecting on Lamentations 3. How God's mercies are new every morning. And this insurance salesman then wrote. And he, he said the reason he wrote that hymn of great is thy faithfulness. Was that God has given me many wonderful displays of his providing care. Which have filled me with astonishing gratefulness. This ill man, because he was ill most of his life, although he lived till 94, he realized God was faithful not just in the big things, but even in the little things of his life. You know, we need to rejoice in that as well. God is always faithful to his covenant and promises, even to you and me, even when we don't deserve it. And the most difficult thing about God's faithfulness is that our triune God, this true God, has revealed himself here in his word, is not after your or my happiness. He's not even after making our life easy. But he desires your and my holiness, our sanctification. If you doubt that, look at John 17 and see how Jesus prayed for that. He said, sanctify them. And the tool that God's word, God uses is his spirit and word. And to be honest, this can be painful. And why do I say that? Because one of the things God's word shows us is Galatians 6, verse 7. God says something there through Paul. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And that verse, in many ways, is a backdrop for Genesis 29. Because God is showing in his faithfulness, there is no karma, there is no blind luck, there is no just, well, you know, what goes around comes around. Because the reality is, God in his sovereignty will not be mocked. He makes sure, particularly even for forgiven believers like us, we will reap what we sow to teach us to hate sin and to push us to trust his faithfulness for every step of our life. And even when we suffer, even when we suffer because of what we have done, we're going to see that here today. And you have to remember the context here because God, by, by that ladder, that stairway really from heaven, revealed his faithfulness and his sovereignty to Jacob as undeserving was he, as he was because he was running because the deceit that, that he had and the scheme he had, had done to his father and his brother or committed against them. And now in verse 1, Jacob, literally in the Hebrew, it says he lifted up his feet and continued to the land of the people of the east. And this reminds us to trust God, trust the Lord for our daily steps. And I say this. Because God is focusing on Jacob's feet for a couple reasons. One is, is Proverbs 16, 9, to remind us a man, man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Are we trusting the Lord for our daily step, or do we walk out the doors of the church and not really have a thought of God until next Sunday? No, we, we need to trust his unchangeable word. We need to, to submit to his leading. And it seems here that God's covenant promises to Jacob and what he revealed really put a spring in his step because it's, it's kind of like he started off and then, then 450 miles later, boom, Jacob is exactly in the right place. When Moses was writing this, recording this from God, they were getting ready to go into the promised land. And God wanted those first readers of Israel, Jacob's descendants, but even us, to realize God directs every aspect of our life. From raising up and tearing down nations to turning kings' hearts to casting of lots to our daily bread, even to each step we take. It's all under the sovereign care of our God. And we're called to live understanding this by prayer and by following his commands. Because God knows better than us. 
And there is no doubt that Jacob, in this whole experience, had heard his mother tell of the providential events of Genesis 24, bringing Abraham's servant to Rebekah. And, and here, it, it probably all seems like history repeating itself. For, for here, Jacob finds man who knows Laban and, and, and his daughter Rachel. In verse 6, they tell him, look, his daughter Rachel. And by the way, that word, the Rachel, means a little ewe lamb. So he says, his little ewe lamb is coming with Laban's sheep. With Laban sheep. And what happens? Does he pray? Thank God. No, testosterone takes over. And he calls these men lazy. Get about your work, basically, he's telling them. Probably to get rid of them. You know, it's kind of like uh, uh, siblings trying to get rid of their, their the little siblings uh, when a friend is over and things like that. And then they complain, though. They complain that, that the stone was too heavy just for a few men. Because that was the ancient security. I mean, wells were, were precious in the Middle East. There was very, very little water in there. I mean, we often think of, of Israel and, and the Middle East like, like Minnesota, of 10,000 lakes, but that's not true. And so you had to protect water. And so they put this very large stone that would take many men to, to remove it. That was their ancient security system. But Jacob here, roughly 77 years old, with all of his bravado, takes things into his own hand. He moves the stone from the well. And they served Rachel by watering her sheep. And then he uses his own two arms again and takes her into his arms and kisses Rachel, probably like the French do maybe when they greet people. I admit, the first time that happened to me as a kid, and I was, we had moved to Brussels, my eyes got big, and I think I even said it, what are you doing? <laughs> and uh, but here's Jacob, the first kissing cousin in the Bible, who's overcome with immense relief and joy, but what's missing? Well, think back to chapter 24. The Abraham servant, He's constantly praying God before he sets out. He, he's thanking God after God answers his prayer. He, he, he's the type of believer we're called to be. Who makes everyone better by directing their eyes to God. And that's something we should be to those around us. Directing their eyes and hearts to God. Speaking about God's word to others, his faithfulness. But Jacob doesn't do that. He kind of acts like it's all him, his Jacobing, his conniving. He doesn't seem now to sense God's involvement. And you know what? That's a struggle sometimes, even for us. Even the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, Moses, stood before the, the people of Israel, and they were complaining, and they were grumbling. And God said, speak to the rock, and he'd provide water. But in anger, what happened? Moses declares, here now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Well, who was going to bring water out of the rock? It was God. But Moses did. By not recognizing God was, he committed something that maybe some has happened to some of you. Identity theft. We don't like it when somebody says that they're us. Use our credit card or rack up bills. God really doesn't like identity theft. <laughs> and Moses was forgiven, but the consequences of his sin was that he would not enter the promised land. Why? Because God will not give his glory to another. And we, you and I, commit identity theft against God when we fail to praise him for what he brings about in our life, for directing our daily steps, acting like our life is in our hands rather than God's. Now the story picks up with Rachel going to, his, to her father Laban, and Laban, and I understand, I mean, we might understand Rachel running, but, but Laban runs back. It's probably because the last time Abraham's servant, Eliezer, came he brought Laban gold. Hey, what's he bringing this time? But here's Jacob. He has nothing. He has the promises of everything. But physically, he has nothing. No doubt they cut up on the family and what was happening to Laban's sister and, and, and things like that, which was Isaac's mother, or, or Jacob's mother. But I doubt Jacob told of his deception. <coughs> does seem like they know about it later, though. 
Verse 14, we read, he stayed with Laban and worked with him. And now this brings us to our next point. Trust the Lord even when we suffer. It's easy sometimes to trust the Lord when everything goes well, but to be honest, when everything goes well, we so easily forget God. We need to trust the Lord when we don't see him. Even when we deserve to suffer for our sin and we're called to patiently endure it. Here's the the seed of Jacob's sin. It's going to bring a bitter fruit. And so we can't feel too bad for Jacob right now. The deceiver is going to be deceived by a master deceiver. In verse 15, as Laban said, because you are my relative, should, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should be your wages be? Laban really is, is, is wondering, what can I get out of this? Laban was not being gracious. In fact, this whole time in the Hebrew, you see it very clearly, but you see it in the English too. This text shows Jacob, is, is, his eyes are focused on, on Rachel being enamored with her over and over again. And Laban knew what was going on, but he also had this other daughter that evidently was kind of a little more difficult to get married off. And you can almost see the wheel scheming in his mind. In verse 16 through 17, we're told Rachel is beautiful in form and appearance. I mean, everything about her was beautiful. Uh, But for Leah, whose name either means weary-eyed or possibly even wild cow, the best thing said of her is she has tender eyes, delicate eyes. I mean, Jacob thought he had found a beautiful wife. And we have to know, while the Bible praises beauty and and wives and husbands should strive to look good for their spouse, to brush your teeth, to clean up, uh, and different things like that. And and Song of Solomon praises that beauty between a husband and wife. But in Proverbs 31, we can't forget that other part. That charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. Now, we should be attracted to our spouse, and we should. But the problem in this whole situation is, again, Jacob didn't pray and ask, Lord, what's your will in this? And the difficult lesson Jason now begins to learn is God who works all things together for our good to those who love and are called, who love God and are called according to this purpose. It's our good. It's to our good that God never lets us get away with our sin without consequences. God is patient. It's true, and and, and to be encouraged, brothers and sisters, God forgives the eternal penalty of our sins. They are paid for by the righteous blood of Christ on the cross, but God does not remove all the consequences of sin. This is so we don't take sin lightly. God's purpose in this is so that we would prayerfully and by God's word root sin out. as God works in us. And the hard reality here is that God often patiently deals with us through suffering. Much more than he does through blessing. He does that by the hands of others and by their injustice to us. Now, continuing on, though, in in this text in chapter 29, while the normal bride price was three years of labor, even slaves in in Israel, as Deuteronomy tells us, were released after six years, Jacob says, I'm going to serve you for seven years. Hey, it's a good deal for Laban. But notice Laban's deceptive answer. And this is why, from the very beginning, Laban knew what he was doing. He says, it is better. He doesn't say, yep, I'm going to give you Rachel for this. No, he says, it's better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. He's a strong guy. He can do a lot. Look at at this stone he rolled away. I, I can make a little money off this guy. And we hear those words, which are wonderful, really, of how those seven years seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. I mean, here's Jacob. He picked his bride. He picked a time. It's a beautiful love story. Things seem to be going well. But then what's the next thing? In the Hebrew, it's, it's really Jacob had to force Laban to follow through in verse 21. Give me my wife. And then he adds crassly again, running by emotions, running by lust, that I may go unto her. 
And God's going to start correcting that attitude. From here on, God will use the painful irony of Laban's deception to reflect Jacob's own sin, to humble him. The first deception all evolved around food and drink, and what's happening here? That's a big celebration. Where there's food and, and there's alcohol, there's drink. There's nothing sinful about alcohol, but there is, it is sinful to get drunk. Jacob knew his father was blind and did everything in a dark tent. Laban will pull this bait and switch at night in a dark tent when Jacob's probably drunk, or at least had too much. Jacob and his mother conspire, and here a father and daughter conspire. Notice the irony. And while Isaac was determined to bless Esau without a thought of God, Jacob was led by his passions to Rachel, while God determined his wife was to be Leah. It was interesting. I videotaped a lot of weddings when I was in seminary. That was my job. And I videotaped a lot of Jewish weddings where the groom would actually go down and, and check to make sure that the woman coming down the aisle was his bride. There was a Middle Eastern wedding, too. I, or I, my boss videotaped. I edited it. And it was interesting. We both noticed we never saw the bride until the very end, which makes what happens here more understandable. And this whole account, as tragic and, and, and troubling as it is, is all written because God is sovereign. So you and I would know that when we're taken advantage of, when we suffer loss, or even when we're the target of some evil scheme by somebody else, we don't have to be afraid. Or even if it's the consequences of our own sin, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to panic. We don't have to feel all is lost. For as the scripture tells us, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. And you and I, no matter what's happening in our life, need to trust him who upholds our cause from heaven. Our faithful God. Psalm 16 tells us, Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You're sovereign, Lord. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines for me have fallen in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. We could lose it all. And if we have eternal life, which we do through Christ, we have everything. That's true for us as believers. That's why this is true from the psalmist for us. Verse 25 tells us, after the marriage was consummated in the dark tent, so it came to pass in the morning, that behold, and there's a lot of shock here, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? What is, uh, was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? These words really are, are echoing Esau's words. I kind of wonder if they stuck in Jacob's throat. Laban gives some lame excuse, and yet even there it echoes Jacob's deception. It kind of seems like Laban now knew about it. And rather than accepting God's will, Jacob determines to work another seven years for Rachel, and he becomes a polygamist with sister wives, which Leviticus 18.18 18 condemns. What's going to happen is sin is going to be compounded. It always happens that way. And while we might like to forget a very important truth that Hebrew, Hebrews reminds us of, that every true child of God is disciplined for whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Realize, God has disciplined Jacob. And God often disciplines and uses difficult people to chasten you and I. It, it might be a boss, it might be an in-law, or even troubles with our children, or troubles with a teacher, or, 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 or somebody else that we know. God will use harsh people, deceitful, lying, selfish people, for your and my sanctification. See, the Lord shows Jacob just how it feels to be deceived and schemed against. Why? Because God, by his Holy Spirit, will often strengthen faith and work godly character by injustice and suffering. We see this all over and over through the Scripture. Isn't that what Paul, who first persecuted the church and then was persecuted for Christ's name, learned? as he wrote from prison to you and I even today, from Philippians 1.29, he says, for to you it's been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, 
but also to suffer for his sake, for his purposes. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when everything seems to turn against us, when our plans seem to be falling apart, don't we wonder, God, are you really there? Have you forgotten me? Have you forgotten your promises? And yet God, the God who determines the end from the beginning, his faithfulness is all over our life, our very steps and even our sufferings. And it's for his glory and our good. And think about, God chose Leah to be Jacob's wife. Why? Because ultimately it would be through her that God would bring his son. Not because of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God as John 1.13 tells us. Look at your suffering. Look at your trials. And I have to do the same. We need to look at them differently. We can't mope. For God hasn't given us what, uh, when, when God hasn't given us what we want. But, but we are to, to realize, even in those times, and to be thankful. Because Hebrews 12.10 tells us, for it's to our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. And that may be difficult. But it's far better than living apart from the covenant promises of God to us through Christ for forgiveness and salvation. Sanctification is difficult. When God disciplines us for our sins, it's difficult. But we need to be thanking God, not only for guiding our daily steps, but for that suffering. Even to sing, as we did at the very beginning of the service, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this instructive and humbling text of your word. Consequences of our sin, how we reap what we sow. They were painfully shown. That truth was painfully shown, not so much in the world, which is, which is how so often we think of this passage, but in the life of your people. And and in these trials, Lord, remind us, and in these times of suffering because of our own sin, help us to, to remember this is not to harm us, but it's for our good, our sanctification, to turn us from our sin so that you might receive glory. Lord, remind us, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So help us to receive this instruction you have for us to be wise and godly, trusting you, for every step we take and in all of our struggles, those we deserve as well, those, as well as those which fall upon us, help us to see they come to us by your loving, sovereign hand. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.